<laughs> right, um, good afternoon everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, all-party parliamentary group on AI evidence session. Um, yes, now we are discussing uh, AI and education, or education and skills specifically, um, and discussing how to equip young people uh, with the skills that they will need to work alongside AI. And I think it's fair uh, to say that the, the adoption of AI is going to permeate into every corner of our lives and understanding uh, how it can be used and how it can't be used I think will be an important skill in the same way that we probably now all know what the limits of uh, computers, mobile phones, technology in our homes is wouldn't necessarily be in the same 30 or 40 years ago, and it's getting that, getting ahead of that curve and making sure people uh, are aware of how they can uh, make the most of it and how we can minimise the potential uh, less positive impact that AI can have and maximise the positive contribution that it can make to education, to society, to our quality of lives, to our way of lives. Uh, embrace that opportunity um, and, and get it uh, and make sure that it is available for all and not just a few who can afford to access it. And, and so to help um, explore how we equip young people particularly, um, but from my own point of view, I'm just putting a slight caveat, which is that um, I think we need to equip everyone. Because young people, obviously, they're, they're a key demographic in the we have them in our school system, we have the ability to communicate with them and influence them uh, and get them uh, involved in this. But I think because of the pace of change, it will, there will be another piece of work to be done on how we make sure that everyone has the opportunity to upgrade their skills and learn about AI. So as I said, we have um, five speakers uh, to help us explore this topic. And rather than hear any more from me, I'm going to invite our first speaker, which is uh, Wayne Holmes. Wayne, good evening. Um, and I think you get, hopefully, you've been told five minutes. I have been told five minutes, thank you. Fantastic. So you have five minutes. And I'm going to be quite tight on time, if I may, because uh, otherwise these things get uh, out of hand. And probably I should, just before I hand back to you, Wayne, I should have said. Um, Please also welcome my uh, co-chairman, Lord Tim Clement Jones, who uh, we established this uh, committee together with getting on for two and a half years. I thought you were going to say relationship. Well, relationship, <laughs> it is. We've been on a foreign country together. Um, and of course, to the Big Innovation Centre for all the support they provide to this very active all-party parliamentary group. So thank you to you and of course to Nikki, who has uh, taken responsibility for this and I think is now, is this public moment? Yeah. Well, it will be. It will be. <laughs> um, who is moving on from the big innovation centre uh, to pursue some new opportunities, I think in California. Yeah, that's uh, the plan. Which is quite exciting. <coughs> she will still be involved on an ad hoc basis mm -hmm. with some of the work that we do, we hope. So, but uh, thank you from me, as this is maybe the last time I've yeah, got yeah. to say to you, uh, for all your efforts on uh, helping this group run uh, so efficiently. Yeah, I would. Should I say something? <laughs> Go on. Yeah. Um, well, really quickly, I just. Well, thank you to everyone, I think. This has been really a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And I've learned a lot. I've met a lot of great people. But, yeah, um, the plan is that my partner and I are moving to California sometime next year. So I'll be contributing on a different basis and working with the Big Innovation Center. But, yeah, we'll be looking at project-based things for now. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Why? <laughs> uh, thank Five you very minutes. much. And so I've been asked, first of all, to explain who I am. So to start with, I'm a lecturer um, in Learning Sciences and Innovation in the Institute of Education Technology at the Open University. And I've actually been involved in ed and technology for a long time, and in AI and education for almost a decade now. And the key thing is that I am not a computer scientist, I'm a learning scientist. And what I'm interested in is how AI can help us um, better understand, but also enhance learning. But I'm also interested in the social and the ethical implications of AI in education. Now, as part of my work, um, I've actually authored uh, three books on AI in education, including this one. Um, and I've been invited to speak to audiences um, about AI in education across the UK, the US, China, Oman, Germany, and various other places. 
and at the moment I'm working uh, particularly with UNESCO um, and their work around AI education and I'm also a member of this APBG's Education Task Force. And <coughs> so when I do talk to people about um, AI's impact on education, I normally look at it in, in, in three levels, if you like. So firstly, learning about AI, and learning with AI, and learning for AI. So learning about AI is learning what AI actually means, and this comes back to the point that was made earlier, that it's for children, but it's also for everybody, in particular in, in our, um, uh, what, you know, what, what does it promise? What are the myths? How can we understand this more effectively? But it also means um, the training or, or introducing young people to um, AI techniques and technologies, which my colleagues will uh, mention in far more detail than me. That's not my area of expertise. Um, but it's also about thinking about what our um, universities should be doing, how we should be training people um, to support AI um, for use in educational context. So moving on then to learning with AI, this is actually my core area of interest and it's all about um, AI technologies that design uh, to support learning. Now the point is that every time I open my uh, computer there's new <coughs> tools out there, there's constantly new tools, but most of these tools are actually student facing and I'm thinking particularly of the systems that refer to themselves as personalised learning systems. Now I mention this because actually these um, give me um, quite a lot of worry. Um, personalised learning, when you talk about it at the beginning, it sounds great. Everything, everybody thinks, yeah, personalised learning is what we should do. But actually what do we mean by personalisation? There are many ways in which you could think of that. And personalisation in particular though, could be in terms of the learning pathways and the learning outcomes. So the learning pathways is the route that an individual student takes to the learning that has been predetermined by the curriculum. And that's what most of the AI um, in education tools do. But the other type of personalised learning is actually supporting <coughs> students to learn what they need to learn, what's specific to them, to self-actualise, to develop their personal agency so they can become the best that they can be. And to give an example of this, a metaphor for this, is um, an Uber versus a bus. Now with a bus, we go start with our journey and we all go to the same destination and after that we have to walk wherever we want to go but with an Uber I can go exactly where I choose to go and um, now it doesn't really matter to me whether these the bus and the Uber take wandering pathways specific ones pretty ones whatever what's far more important to me is that <coughs> out that, that, that final um, destination the other part of these tools and the logic that's used around them is that they are efficient. We are helping students learn efficiently in order to prepare them for examinations. But instead of efficiency, as I say, we should be thinking about self-actualisation, agency, developing the best version of what they can be. But with these systems and all of these applications, we need to think about both the ethics and the practical implications of these pedagogical choices. So the ethics we hear about in AI all the time focuses very much on the data and algorithms, both of which are important. <coughs> but we're not talking tonight about AI, we're talking about AI in education. And what happens when the education <coughs> conflicts, meets the AI? What's gonna happen there? So finally, um, is the learning for AI. And this in many respects is the core of tonight's um, session. Um, and as um, you mentioned earlier, one of my notes here is it's not just for the young people, it's for everybody. We really do need to focus. And what we need to focus on, in my opinion, is what it is that makes us humans. What is it that separates us from machines? What is it that we can do that computers can't do? Now the problem is that the distinction between what we can do and what computers can do used to be pretty easy. It was fairly obvious. So things like we can identify people in pictures and we can understand what people say to us. But we know that that distinction is now moved. So now lots of AI can do those kind of things. So one of the big areas that they can do is knowledge acquisition. They can give us access to lots of information and they can give us, allow us to find it and work out what we're going to do with it. And 
But that's what's embedded in our uni our education systems at the moment. But what we need is to go beyond those simplistic understandings. We need to think about what is it that we do in schools, in classrooms, in universities. So what we need to do is to focus on what I call is those 21st century skills. What you know, people call. So things like uh, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, all those kinds of things. And we need to do that in ways in which the AI supports. So instead of the AI starting to do stuff, it needs to support us in doing these rather more interesting aspects of learning. Wayne, thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Um, um, I'm sure that will have generated some uh, discussion. Did you want to come in, Tim? Yeah, I just really wanted to uh, promote <coughs> Wayne a bit further. Um, <coughs> you briefly at the end you mentioned the whole issue about collaboration, <coughs> creative skills, critical thinking. Why do you think we're so focused still on things like STEM skills, and in particular a rather narrow group of skills like coding and so on, and, and yet we're not focusing in the AI age at a broader set of these skills in order to be able to make the best use of AI? It, it, it's a big question, isn't it? I think the problem is that it's, it's what's embedded in our education systems and has been for, you know, as long as I know, but it's becoming more embedded over recent years. So the focus entirely on knowledge acquisition has become so important leading students to be able to pass their examinations. So two years of study, knowledge acquisition, bang, do the exam. Whereas actually that's an incredibly limited way. I'm not suggesting for a second that knowledge acquisition is not important. I'm merely saying it's only part of the story. We need to help our students to develop these other skills so that they can use the knowledge. You know, the big companies don't give a monkeys about what you know. What they're interested in is how you deal with the knowledge that you access, how you criticise it, how you work with other people, how you can develop it further. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, we will move on to our second uh, speaker, which is Elena Sinan. Uh, is that right? Elena? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me today. So I'm Elena. I'm the founder of the Acorn Aspirations and Teens and Artificial Intelligence. But I'm also um, a mum of two children, one um, 17 and one is uh, nearly six. And the reason why I started my enterprise um, at the time when I was completing my master's in war studies and wanted to go back to international development was because I was really frustrated by the fact that my daughter was coming home every day learning to pass an exam. And I wanted to do something different. I wanted to show her that the real world is really not about passing an exam. So I started taking her to hackathons, adult hackathons, and we competed in different teams. And sometimes my team would win, sometimes her team would win. But what I found is that during a two-day experience, my daughter managed uh, to meet a lot of people, so it's networking skills. She learned to ask questions through design thinking um, and, and design thinking processes that she learned during a hackathon. She learned uh, how to do market research, she learned a bit of coding, she learned uh, various other skills. Most importantly, she learned how to work in a team collaboratively. Um, and she pitched her idea to investors. Um, and I thought, why is that not taught in schools? All those valuable skills that Wayne has just described. Um, and, and I decided, okay, um, I'm gonna run the first hackathon, a team hackathon. I did it in 2015. And the first hackathon was run in London Bridge, and Rebecca Brooks' offices. Um, who was at that time recovering from a hacking scandal, so I couldn't say mm. hackathon. I had to sacrifice the word <laughs> hackathon, and I called my event a coding event. Uh -huh. Yes, although it was a lot more than just a coding event. So since then, um, a lot of people have reached out and asked me, Elena, you must run more of this, and I thought I wouldn't because it was time consuming, it was exhausting, and I couldn't see how I could make money out of this. And, and as a mom, you know, I, I really wanted to make sure if I get involved in something, it has to be sustainable. Um, but many people have reached out, and since then I've run over 20 hackathons. We're now across the world, running them in San Francisco, New York, um, you know, um, Seattle, Kenya, even at the end of um, August. Uh, not as much interest in the UK, <coughs> by the way, in terms of funding and in terms of interest in general. And I did wonder where it's coming from. But every time we reach out to the schools, they don't have the time because they are so, so restricted in terms of what their mandate is, in terms of what their KPI is. 
They really are just preparing our kids to pass an exam, I'm afraid. And that, I'm afraid, is not sufficient in this day and age. And another thing that I noticed as mom, as, as somebody who really uh, was a foreigner at that time coming into this country, is I felt I have never seen the mo a more unequal society. And I have traveled and lived in Africa, in Asia, in the Balkans. I've come from Central Asia. I honestly have not come across a system within education, a system of, of life, I suppose, which really reinforces those structural inequalities. And it all starts with the education system, unfortunately. And it's the, that inequality, the private schools versus a state school, something I've never encountered in other countries to the same extent, is what I feel perpetuates those inequalities that really give some access to the technologies and others not. So it's, the, it's creating the bigger divide of the haves and have nots, and it's not really helping the society move and compete um, at, the, at the global level. And so um, I don't really have an answer uh, to the bigger questions that we're discussing here, but I wish every school had embraced the system that we have developed in-house which we're probably um, underestimating by calling it a hackathon because it's a lot more than that. It's developing entrepreneurship skills, it's developing innovation and growth mindset, it's developing collaborative skills, and it's what the industry needs. We're collaborating with companies like DeepMind, like Microsoft, like Google, like HSBC, like IBM, and various others who are dying to, to get hands on the innovative minds that we're producing. Amongst you, there are five teenagers in here. Now those teenagers, if you ask them to show them your, their CVs, they have CVs uh, <coughs> as long as three, four pages. And they have been coming to our hackathons for four years now. Now, uh, one of the teenagers in our network is already at Imperial College London and is speaking at ICML and Europe's and various other machine learning conferences. We've d been doing this uh, you know, for four years and it just shows to us that the impact we're creating is uh, incredible. We can now calculate it and show this kind of impact. And what schools need and that is that very same approach to hackathons. Schools as hackathons. This is what I would advocate. Thank you very much indeed. Tim, did you want to? Yeah, just, just a quickie. Before yeah. we hear from you the very, other side. You very tactfully passed over um, uh, the sort of slightly odious comparison of the way the UK take up of hackathons was less or not as good as some other uh, countries. I mean, what, how would you explain that? What was, what was, what is the motivation? Is our education system more rigid, or do we have a different mindset? What, what's, well, what's the issue? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Well, actually, well, the first time when I tried to run hackathons, I was told go to Tower Hamlets. Tower Hamlets is the most deprived area in London. You know, they need it, so go there. I called twenty-two schools. Not a single one responded. Not a single one wanted to hear. Not Second, a, secondary or primary? Secondary. I only worked with secondary schools. Yeah. None of them really wanted to hear. Um, this time, just a few weeks ago, we ran um, a hackathon across the entire UK. We sent the competition to 2,000 schools. Very few of them have expressed an interest, although we've given them all the guides, all the information. They really are you know, very rigid in terms of their approaches. They don't want to be receptive and to accept the information. Uh, if I were to go to China, because or Brunei or some other dictatorial regime, you know, uh, who, for instance, we are working already in Brunei. Uh, Chinese government or Brunei government would tell their, their their schools to jump. They would jump. That is the beauty of centralized system. When they decide, let's teach AI in primary schools. Every single primary schools school is going to teach AI, and they are already teaching AI in China. It's a dodgy country, dodgy ethics, I understand yeah, that. There may be but, some conflict, might not there really? <laughs> could well be, but when uh, the problem in this country, in order to make a difference in, in education, you literally have to knock on every single door. There is no way it seems to influence. Is there any European country that actually you would use as a model? Finland. Yes. When they're teaching AI. Uh, Finland is doing a lot of interesting things. They're teaching AI uh, to the government. They've developed this really remarkable course, uh, yeah. obviously, that has been taken by many thousands of people. But their system, number one, only teachers with master's degrees are allowed to teach. Now, there are many ways to become a teacher in this country, <laughs> if you know. But, uh, you, know you can just you take some courses to, to become a teacher. But in Finland, uh, you can only teach when you have a proper master's degree, so they're qualified teachers who really know their stuff. Um, their curriculum is much broader. They really focus on a broader range of skills. 
Um, and they seem to be producing a well-rounded um, students who seem to be succeeding, and 66% of them going to university, whether that is right or not, that's a different question altogether. But nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, when um, they are assessed and compared to other countries, they seem to be doing much, much better. So. Okay, thank you for that. Now, I think it's only fair that we hear the other side of <laughs> yes, uh, that potential yeah. coin. Um, and so I would like to invite here in Europe, Newmark, sorry. I know, sorry, Kira. Thank um, you. Lori, introduce who you are. Uh, so I'm Kira Newmark. I'm the Deputy Director for STEM Strategy and Education Technology in the Department for Education. That means that my role is to advise ministers on policy around how we might increase our STEM skills pipeline. And I'm very happy to come back to some of the uh, excellent points already raised by Lord Clement Jones. Um, but also a large part of my role is looking at how we embed ed tech more effectively in our schools, <coughs> further education and higher education and adult learning systems. Bit of a mouthful. Um, so I think I'd probably start off by slightly challenging the idea that the department is on the other side of this debate. Um, actually, I think that what I'd really like to stress during tonight's discussion is that some of the issues we're talking about here are absolutely massive and will be hugely challenging for all parts of our education system to deal with. I don't think that we're after radically different outcomes. We might have different views on how we get there, but fundamentally, I think we have more in common than divides us. Um, and I think that is quite important to bear in mind. The couple of points that I just wanted to make are really contextual ones. The first is, um, I'm very pleased actually that Stephen's already recognized, as has uh, Elena, that um, the challenge that we face around the skills of tomorrow are not only limited to what we teach our children today. We are now at a point where we have the highest ever employment rate and the lowest ever unemployment rate. And that reflects the fact that we also have a pool of people who are going into our workforce which is <coughs> narrowing because just the population rate of growth has slowed. On top of all of that, we have an aging population who will be working longer than ever before. So we have to recognise that we cannot focus solely and only on those in schools, because if we do, we miss an enormous opportunity. I think the second contextual point that I want to make is that um, <coughs> the strongest message we get from our teaching workforce is please stop changing things. We have a teacher recruitment and retention crisis, and that has been how it's been recognised by ministers. So whilst the idea that we would have master's level teachers is lovely, uh, in practicality we're struggling to recruit the teachers that we already need, and we can probably talk a lot more about that issue. But I think that what I, I would flag is that from a teacher's perspective, it's not for want of interest, it's not because they don't care, it's because they physically don't have the hours in the day. Uh, and there are something like 2,000 different organisations who regularly lobby stuff at schools to say, come and pick me, come and pick my hackathon, come and pick my coding club, come and pick me, pick me, pick me. That's hugely challenging for a school to understand what's the best thing out there. And maybe as a collective, we could do more to help schools understand that. I think the last point I'd make, so I'm conscious of time, um, is that I think that the department has recognised, and Ofsted has certainly recognised, that actually maybe in the knowledge versus skills debate, and I hope we don't spend too, time, too much time this evening uh, narrowing down on that one aspect of, that, of this hugely complex area, <coughs> but in the knowledge and skills debate, I think we have taken a step in the right direction. So the Ofsted uh, organisation has just um, recently announced that they're going to introduce a new assessment framework. That assessment framework is explicitly about looking at how it helps support schools to recognize not just good KPI exam results, but what they are doing to explicitly help and support their students to build the types of soft skills that we've been already talking about so far. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you very much indeed. Did you have a point you wanted yes, to say? Yes, if you were going to give guidance to those 2,000 organisations or so about, you know, uh, to your schools about the 2,000 organisations that lob stuff at them, <laughs> uh, I thought that was a great expression, clock, you know, um, 
what would you what would you say about this debate that we are just beginning to have about uh, critical thinking skills, creative skills, on, on top of STEM skills yeah. and so on? I, I mean, say how how are you how would you best advise those many secondary schools who are not responsive perhaps to suggestions of hackathon but might be responsive to something else? How how, how do you sift through? Uh, that because clearly you, you, there has to be some central yeah. direction. Absolutely. There? So I think I'd say two things. The first is I think in hackathon in the hackathon space and actually the computer science space particularly, we've just created the new National Centre for Computing Education. Like that is basically brand new. It came out this year. It's being led by people like the British Computing Society, STEM Learning, and Raspberry Pi. It's supported by people like Google and Microsoft and all of the other major tech players that you can think of. And the whole point of that as an organization is specifically to help signpost schools to help them find the best quality resources that are out there and crucially to help them deliver those resources. And I'm very happy to talk more about it as we go. The other thing I would say is, I mean, I, I talk about this a lot within the engineering uh, side of my role, but evaluation is so important the number of times I see a new initiative and I ask, this is great, it looks fantastic, what evidence do you have that this has made any impact difference at all? And the answer is nearly none. Half the time, a lot of these organizations don't even collect the information of who went to the sessions, let alone something really basic like the gender. So we have no idea if these things are actually helping. Quite possibly, some of them might be hindering by putting people off, which would be even worse and completely the opposite of what a lot of these really good, really well-meaning organisations would want to achieve. So please, please, please evaluate. But you, do, sorry, no, no. Steve, but you do accept that we need to have a, a broader look, not purely in the STEM uh, 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 prism, so to speak. We need to look beyond. I think we do need to look beyond, but I think that what I would say is. I slightly worry when we talk about the idea that there's somehow a divide between STEM and other subjects, or worse, STEM and the arts. I think that you can foster those creativity, that problem solving skill ability, that collaboration, communication, those things can be fostered through STEM as they can be fostered through other subjects. STEM is not the be all and end all, and I say that as the person responsible for STEM. <laughs> But I think that we have to recognise if you look at the skills that employers, the likes of the CBI and others, press us for, STEM still remains the one that they single, or the series of subjects that they single out as most important to them. Yeah. Um, in terms of making um, small changes that could have a big impact, you talked about this plethora of uh, opportunities that are thrown at schools um, without necessarily knowing the quality of them. Yeah. Do you think there would should be, could be, uh, some sort of quality mark, quality assessment that the, 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 these programs can go through so that you can know what they are adding to, so you can prioritise. So we aren't at that stage yet, but I think that's something that we've been working on with uh, and led by the Royal Academy of Engineering, Engineering UK and other private sector organisations is looking at some kind of code of best practice to build on the work that we've done on the year of engineering and the intent would be to launch that uh, later this year, but that would indicate that at least the organisations involved in that activity have willingly signed up to some baseline of evaluation. So if I were a school looking at it, it would be a reassurance to me that yes, okay, these people have tried to take a step in the right direction. Fantastic, thank you. Right, um, we move <coughs> on, and next we have uh, David Nash. David. Thank you Stephen and thank you for having me here. So I'm David Nash, I'm Head of Policy and Corporate Affairs at the ECITB, the Engineering Construction Industry Training Board, a bit of a mouthful I'm afraid. So we are the statutory skills body for the engineering construction <coughs> industry and engineering construction <coughs> is a subset of engineering, um, so it's all around the design, installation, maintenance and decommissioning of some of our most important national infrastructure. So we operate in the nuclear industry, um, oil and gas, renewables, pharmaceuticals, food processing uh, and other sectors too. My role is I look after our policy, communications and campaigns team. That includes our research and we published um, earlier in May a report looking at the impact of technological change and industry 4.0 
on our industry. And that's really what I want to focus my remarks on, which is to provide a perspective on how not just AI, but digital technologies more broadly are changing this industry and what that means for the skills required of new people, <coughs> both young people and existing <coughs> workers coming into what is a growing sector and a growing industry. And you only have to look at the government's announcements around <coughs> net zero carbon emissions to know there's going to be a lot of work in retrofitting all of our industrial plants and processes across the country over the decades to come. So it's a growth industry in that regard. You'd probably expect me, coming from an engineering background, to say it's all about STEM, but I agree with Kira and others that actually uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this isn't just about STEM occupations when we're talking about AI. Um, and actually, I think when we look at what the skills our employers will say they'll need in the future, um, it's very much uh, they're looking at a skill set that's diverse and varied. And whilst there's always going to be the need for your typical technical or craft engineering roles, I'd like to highlight three other areas, some of which have been touched on already, that are going to be crucial to young people in their careers in this industry. Firstly, and you'll hear about it all the time, I'm sure, uh, digital skills, I would argue that in the decades to come, in this industry, digital, digital skills will be as important to the industry as the core engineering trades. And we're already seeing how Industry 4.0 is fundamentally altering existing roles. So to take an example, inspection on offshore oil rigs no longer being done by site personnel. Increasingly, that's being done using remote predictive maintenance systems and sensors. Industry is <coughs> going to need more of the, these people to manage these systems. Data scientists, robotic engineers, at the moment, you know, they're competing from the same limited talent pool for these people as other parts of the economy as well. Secondly, no one's really touched on this, but I think more broadly, young people are going to need transferable skills. So according to the US Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics, the average person uh, in the US changes job 11.9 times in their working lifetime. And by transferable skills, I don't just mean soft skills, the ones that are talked about all the time, people skills, business skills, I also mean management skills. I also mean the ability to acquire the knowledge, skills, and experience of a, an occupation that isn't the one that you're trained up to do, but one that's similar. So we're not training at people for single occupations through their working lives. And in our sector, that's really crucial because it's an industry that has ebbs and flows. It follows the economic cycle. The need to transfer workers to different projects is really important. And then finally, it's already been touched upon, but this industry has major problems in terms of transitioning to the low carbon economy, uh, harnessing AI. We can't do it if we have our traditional mindset as engineers when we're thinking about these problems. So creative thinking, innovation skills um, will be really, really important. Just in terms of what we can do um, uh, you know, as policy makers and parliamentarians, um, just a few remarks by way of conclusion. I definitely think that we need to think um, about instilling digital and technology skills uh, into training and apprenticeships for engineers regardless of their program. So, you know, no longer should you just be a welder and you learn that trade. You need to understand how digitalization and AI affects welding, for instance. That's really important. I think we need to move away from teaching, uh, you know, teaching purely by discipline and look at examples. I mean, Finland's been mentioned, but where we look, Finland's been trialing phenomenon-based learning, project-based learning, alongside the traditional curriculum, which gives young people the ability to think creatively and solve problems collectively uh, in terms of real-life challenges that, you know, that we as a society face. No one's mentioned lifelong learning, but by extension of the comment about this not just being for young people, I think that's very, really, very really important. And then finally, I think the one thing we really lack um, in education skills is the sort of long-term vision and strategy that we have in other parts of policy. So we don't have the equivalent of the 10-year NHS plan uh, or you know the, the, the visions that have been set out, the sector deals in the industrial industrial strategy. And that's important really because we, we don't want to fall into the trap of training up young people for today's job market. We need to think about what does this labour market look like or what will it look like in 2040 and beyond? What are the skills that will be required and how we make sure that training uh, and upskilling 
uh, regardless of the age of the learner, um, reflects that changing labour market. Thank you very much. You've got some great ideas there, and in particular, what you want to see out of the education system, digital skills, transferable skills, innovation skills. How much traction are you getting uh, with uh, seeing these ideas <coughs> put into practice? Well, we are, or Clement Jones, in, in part, uh, you know, someone, an organisation that can have an effect in that we are a statutory training board. We invest £25 million um, worth of income that we collect through our levy into training and development across the industry. We're starting to think now, as part of a new strategy that we've published, in terms of how do we invest in training provision and looking at the government's you know, ed tech strategy, how do we make sure that the learning is done. And I think actually academic institutions are coming a long way ahead in terms of uh, virtual reality, um, AI assisted learning. The FE sector is probably a little bit further behind and a lot of our training happens in an FE environment. <coughs> we're, you know, we're, we're, I think we're part of the solution, but absolutely we have, um, we have conversations with our colleagues in government about this too. Right, and, and, but the, so the, the <coughs> spear point for you is FE, basically, is it? This? I think FE has catching up to do in this respect. So some of the auger review will be relevant absolutely, to absolutely. what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave you as I have another meeting, but I'm going to hand over to my co chair which is why we have co chair to introduce our last speaker, Kevin. Okay. It's always utterly seamless here, as you <laughs> <laughs> Right, um, we have Kelly Smith, who is the Senior Policy Advisor on Education to the Royal Society. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for having me here this evening. Um, uh, so I'm a Senior Education Policy Advisor at the Royal Society. The Royal Society, for those of you who don't know, um, is a self-governing fellowship uh, of about 1,600 of the world's most distinguished scientists working across a really, really broad range of disciplines in academia and also in industry as well. Um, I'm going to talk first of all this evening about our education system and specifically about our post 16 education system and then I'll talk a bit more specifically about the types of skills and knowledge that we might need in a future where new technologies are constantly being developed. Um, and I would just like to add that uh, in agreement with some of my fellow speakers, even the Royal Society thinks this is not just about science and maths, so there's definitely a breadth of subjects that, that is required. Um, so the Royal Society, I'm sure with, with most people here in the room today, um, believes that jobs are currently changing and will continue to be transformed by the, the new technologies emerging over, over the coming years. Some jobs might be lost altogether, others will be created that don't exist yet. Um, students who are at school now will potentially have to change jobs and possibly even industries more frequently than, than ever before during the course of their careers. Um, we think that if we want young people to succeed in this changing workplace, we need to make sure they have the right range of knowledge and skills by the time they leave school. And this should include the opportunity to study a wider range of subjects to the age of 18, to understand how these subjects connect uh, in real world context, and to develop these trans transferable skills that we've already talked about this evening, communication, problem solving, teamwork. And I'll come back to those skills in a minute as well. Um, students in the UK specialise much earlier than many of their international counterparts. Um, who often will take a, a more broad range of subjects throughout school to the age of 18, many of whom will study baccalaureate style qualifications in other countries to the age of 18 as well. Uh, in theory, students in England, Wales and Northern Ireland study three A-levels, um, but in reality, the average number of A-levels taken is now 2.7 per student, and that has been decreasing over the last 10 years. Specialising at such an early point in education does not equip young people effectively um, for the rapidly changing and unpredictable labour market that we're in at the moment and could make retraining later in life difficult. It also does not help students learn how to be informed citizens, to contribute to democracy and society. Too often when students specialise at this point in the number of subjects they take, they also specialise in the discipline that they're learning from, so students will often just choose all sciences or all humanities subjects. Um, and might not benefit from a, a breadth of disciplines at that point. In terms of the remit of this APPG in particular, um, a major public dialogue conducted by the Royal Society a couple of years ago in 2016 um, showed that most people hadn't even heard of the term machine learning. Um, less than 10% of people that we spoke to had heard of the term. Um, and in addition, recent study by the Society shows there's a vastly increased demand for data science skills um, in the current job market. 
Overall, the growth of jobs requiring data science skills has increased by 35% since 2013, um, and there was evidence that that demand was growing in every region as well. Um, I'm sure that we're, we're all aware that having a, a population with the skills and experience necessary to navigate the AI-enabled world will be crucial for the UK in the future. This does not just include skills which are scientific or mathematical um, or even ethical and societal. It includes the critical thinking, ability to analyse, how to work collaboratively and how to communicate your work to others in your field and your work to the public as well. These are the types of transferable skills which will be invaluable for students who need to move jobs later in life or for those who need to retrain as adults as well. So there are a couple of things, just to finish, um, a couple of steps that the government could take to address some of these issues, I think. Um, firstly, to ensure that all <coughs> students have access to a broad and balanced post-16 curriculum, <coughs> so that early specialisation doesn't come from a young person's ability to engage with new concepts later in life, um, or to retrain for a new career in adulthood. Uh, this would mean making some changes to the current system so that students are able to study a greater number of subjects or concepts, not necessarily subjects as we think about them now, themes and concepts maybe instead. Um, and also that mathematical, scientific and ethical concepts relating to artificial intelligence are embedded across primary and secondary curricula um, from, a, from a younger age. Um, and just finally to finish, uh, we also think that to, in order to introduce these key concepts in schools, government should work <coughs> with the math and computing communities and the scientific communities, with businesses and with educational professionals to ensure that these insights are built in at a very young age. And acknowledging what Kira said about teacher retention and teacher supply, there obviously needs to be a lot of work done to help support teachers in kind of delivering this, this new curriculum and this new knowledge as well. Well, can I say that's one hell of a critique, isn't it? I mean, you represent uh, some of the greatest brains in the country. I mean, is there an element of frustration here by some of those uh, 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 scientists and others that the Royal Society represents at the speed at which we're not changing or the, the lack of speed at which we're, we're changing? Because, I mean, really, you're looking for a, pretty much for a revolution in in our education system, particularly at secondary level, aren't you? Yeah, I think it's it's some frustration, but I think it's more of a recognition that we've reached a point where this system that's been in place, you know, A-levels were introduced in 1951. Um, this system's been in place for a very long time, and it has worked very well for that period of history, but we're now <coughs> at a point where we need this greater breadth of skills. We need students to be able to move between different careers in different industries. So I think the Royal Society, um, it's, it's a slight frustration maybe, but I think we're just coming to the point where we realise that something needs to be done at this stage, um, and we're looking into what that new system might look like. And you are in dialogue with everybody, including Kira and others, and universities, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and so there is a feeling of positivity about the, the, the way things are moving forward, yeah. even if it may not be quite as fast enough for uh, all your uh, splendid people's <laughs> taste. I think so. Yes, well, life was ever thus, I suspect. Um, I'm, uh, yes, you want to come Can back here? Quickly? Um, build on actually the point that Kelly's made. So I think that the point about A-level reform is a really important one, but I think it's worth recognising that this isn't simply a school-level reform. If you reform A-levels, the reality is the way our A-level system is set up reflects the way our university system is set up, which is we have three-year degrees instead of four-year degrees, like the rest of the world. So if you want to have a broader and more balanced curriculum, you therefore need to move to a different degree system with different funding. And that then brings us back to things like the Augur review and the challenges that we have around funding. So I think it's important to recognise that whilst we are absolutely in dialogue, this is not something that you can just say, yeah, let's just drop it on the school system and hope for the best, because you're going to end up actually potentially damaging one of the things that we always hold up as the jewel of our educational crown, which is our higher education system. Yeah, and I think if you keep talking to Wayne, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you'd find that, that you have a revolution on your hands. I mean, i.e., this isn't just about you know, altering the system a little bit here and there. It's about fundamentally uh, looking again at the system and the way in which you can use AI to make appropriate education for the future with technology as we know it. So, I mean, you know, as we, as we might envisage it. So actually, it all comes together in terms of how we can get that change. Um, let me, before we throw open to the audience, and I can see this is going to be um, one of these terrific discussions, um, I think there's been a, a common factor here that we need a level of 
transferable skills, reskilling, agility, whatever you like to call it. And so, uh, uh, as, uh, as Stephen said right at the very beginning, this isn't just about young people. In fact, it's very much about you know older cohorts really as well. Um, you know, even those now in their mid and late twenties are going to have to reskill. Um, and be agile or, or transferable or whatever the appropriate expression would be. So I'm just going to have a quick, you know, couple of sentences from each of you about whether or not there's a secret source um, to delivering this uh, form of agility in education. I mean, how can we get from A to B in this respect? Wayne. Um, well, the first thing I want to say is how fabulous um, this um, group are. I'm so pleased with, with what everyone's been saying here. Um, <coughs> is there a secret source? I think it's it's a realization about um, ambition. You know what we think is the ambition for the country broadly, and how that trickles down. But for me, what needs to happen very much is um, we need to develop an ecosystem around um, the kind of technologies we develop, the kind of ambitions we have for our schools, the kind of things we're developing that works together. But part of the problem is. And this is something I saw very much at one of the UNESCO conferences, is that we have very defined groups. We have groups of people who are experts in AI, for example, who really don't understand education. And I'm not being unfair there, they really don't. But <coughs> equally, we have groups of educators who really don't understand AI and what the potential implications of that are. So we need people brokering this conversation in the middle as well. And part of the problem is, and I've mentioned this to you earlier, um, you know, trying to get funding in this area. In all good bookshops, by the way. It's, 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 it's trying to get the funding to move this work forward in the UK is profoundly difficult. Um, so um, the UKRI recently did a funding call for centres for doctoral training in AI, and they have put out a lot of money into that. We, along um, the Oak University, along with UCL, so two rather you know big universities, put in a bid for a doctor of training centre for um, AI in education, and we didn't get anywhere. Now it could be our proposal, absolutely, but no one else is looking at education either. So it's brokering these conversations that are not happening, and for me that's the starting point. I'm not sure it's the secret source, but it's a, it's it's the start of. Did you want to just? Yeah, yeah, I just want to say that we did probably many of you know we did this uh, big ecosystem report where we looked at uh, the investment into AI in the UK. Uh, we found that most of the investment went into marketing and advertisement and fintech, and then of course some around the fintech, health tech and other. But edtech, education technology, and GovTech was hardly any investment mm -hmm. coming into. Uh, and that investment could easily come from public procurement. That's the one yeah. now that's really important. Great. Um, on funding, I'm really concerned that there are some schools in this country, including my son's school, that cannot afford some basic provision like head teachers. Can you imagine a school without a head teacher? I have not heard of that before, but it's, it's real, it's happening. I mean, uh, based on what I've been reading, it cost this country 600 million at the cost of Brexit. So all this money could be spent on education, on really upskilling the teachers, uh, which is, uh, I think, an urgent need. Uh, for me, uh, what is really fundamental is to think about the purpose of education. This has been lost completely. Education has not changed in over 100 years. Um, it was okay to teach like that, I don't know, Victorian times or earlier, when we needed people who do not think, but they just follow the rules and follow, you know, work in factory, follow whatever is, is, um, is needed. Right now we need thinkers, we need, uh, we really have a thinking skills gap rather than a technology skills gap in my view. And, and there needs to be a complete rethink and overhaul of the education system. So if re revolution needs to, happen, it needs to happen in education. And we all need to work collectively with the industry. So if the industry are the ones that are screaming and crying out for those skills, uh, schools perhaps need to work with industry, those who really can tell what, what the skills really are and work together. So we need to somehow bridge the schools, bridge the in, with the industry um, who, who know best um, what is required. And I think that's what's really missing. They're kind of working in silence. We have some fantastic initiatives like Founders for Schools, um, like you know the App Work Finder. So 
industry needs to offer work experience, internship, volunteering opportunities to kids so that they could really experience what it's really like in the real world. Because without that, they're studying a knowledge-based sub subjects which are completely useless and no longer relevant. And if you speak to any of the teenagers here or anywhere else, all they're doing is regurgitating just to pass an exam. Mm. Schools have turned into an exam factory and nothing but. Thank you, Lena. Another revolutionary? Yes. What do you think, Kira? <laughs> so I think that, again, I'd, I'd go back to that Ofsted framework that I mentioned earlier, which is I think that is specifically trying to tackle the accusation that schools are somehow turning into exam factories. Uh, but I couldn't agree with you more about the importance of employers <coughs> and businesses engaging effectively with schools. You know, it's quite saddening, actually, that in the latest CBI survey, we'd seen the number of employers engaging directly with schools dropping, not increasing, at a time when it couldn't be more important. And I think that one of the positives that we've seen, actually, about the apprenticeship changes we've made is that we've seen real ownership of employers trying to set the standards around apprenticeships that they want and are relevant for them. And that has generally been one of the things that they've cited as positive of the reforms. Um, I think in terms of, of that sort of secret source, for me, it's cultural. Um, I think that, um, so I've been reading a really interesting book by Richard Gerva, which says, um, it's not systems and structures that create change, it's people. Mm -hmm. And absolutely every single piece of behavioral insights literature or research that the department does comes back to the same things, which is it's your teacher and your parents <coughs> and your broader societal choices that influences the choices that you then make. And that is hugely important in the context of a world where we need to be more agile and more inclined towards retraining, because actually as a society, we tend to say, okay, I'm 21, I've done my time at university, thanks very much, I'm not gonna do any more, except for the odd bit of whatever that my employer lays on, which actually, if you look at the research, is probably pretty low level in something like health and safety training. Not really the kind of high level skills reform that we would perhaps need in the type of world that we're talking about here. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Dave. Yeah, I agree with what Kira said. I'm surprised you didn't mention the government's national retraining scheme, yeah. which is, which is, I mean, it's in its early stages, but it's looking it's to in pilot form. Is it pilot form? Yeah. Indeed. So looking to, <laughs> sorry, about to be, about to be, yeah. <laughs> not quite yet. Uh, which is looking at you know, pre-pilot form. Uh, <laughs> if that's a term for it, I'll go with that. It's looking at um, people who are employed in at-risk industries and how do you, you know, upskill them for, for future work. I think that has, depending on the findings of the pre-pilot, uh, the pilot, that has a lot of potential. But I agree with Kira. I don't think we've got the kind of the mindset that embraces lifelong learning <coughs> in this country and we really have. And I think, actually, within engineering construction, <coughs> we know it's an aging workforce. We know the people that are less receptive to reskilling and retraining tend to be the people that have been doing the core engineering roles for 10, 20 years. And that can be a challenge at times. But I also fundamentally agree this is about employers too. So, you know, employer investment in training, you know, as we know, isn't as high as in other countries. Um, employers being prepared to allow their workers to reskill and looking at actually like they do in they're doing in Scotland, looking at how employers utilise skills better in the workplace. So we don't have a, a mass of overqualified people working in, you know, in some cases substandard jobs. You know, that has to change too. So it's not just about the government. You almost got to mentioning the idea of individual learning accounts, which <laughs> actually I resisted. I think that is, I know I can see that, I see there were barriers there, but actually that is what many people think is the way to overcome some of this. Um, yes, so I would agree. The, the role of employers um, is, is hugely important, as is you know, the shift towards lifelong learning. I think we really need to make more of that in this country. Um, but at a school level, I think a really, really important factor would be to embed some of these transferable skills in across more subjects. So with things like data skills, that's not just for sciences, it's not just for maths. Thinking about how you use data in geography, psychology, business, those kinds of things, and making sure that um, when you have those transferable skills, it's across all of the subject areas and they're all equally responsible for teaching those skills to students. Great, thank you very much. Right, well we're going to throw it open. We've uh, had a, a very interesting canter around the course already. I can see a hand at the back there. I'm going to take three questions 
and then throw them at the panel and then they can decide whether or not to stay stum um, or to actually say something. And with this panel, I suspect there won't be any contest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Tom Picker, I'm a company tenor expert. My main concern is actually we seem to be creating a perfect storm that we can't cope with. Um, and what does that mean? I think <coughs> if, I, if I look at the analysis of, of retail industry or any industry, I'm doing a, um, a presentation at a conference next, next week. I'm demonstrating actually some of the digital decision making is actually reducing profits by about 23%. And that's all around psychology. Um, so that's, that's one point I'd like to make in terms of context and when I think it's coming from. There are two things I think with um, education. One is knowledge, which schools are all about knowledge. The other one's about intelligence. And intelligence, in my view, is about fixing problems. Um, and if you look at that person's ability to fix problems, that's very much centered around what the, um, the lady stepping on the way down is about the way we interact with each other, and the way we talk and the hackathon. Whereas the machine is a completely different piece. It's got algorithms and it's got data. Um, and in my simple engineering, I'm an engineer by background, you know, the two things, one moves at a rate of knots that the human being cannot keep up with, and the other is a completely different um, piece. And I, I read a book actually last year, not for any sort of self-gratifying reason, but just to think this thing through myself. And actually, I think one of the things that saved us is our inability to change. You know, um, as, a, you know as, as a as a nation, and I think because we've got this new thing which really can move at the rate of knots, we're, we're creating a very difficult um, challenge. So I'd like to raise. Well, I'd like, I've got one question in that context, which is around. You think that that's a good thing, the inability to change? Yeah, I think it saved us. Yeah, I think it saved that's us. That's a great thesis. I think I, I think it saved us from ourselves. Yeah. So if you look at the histories, the people like Hitler and other such unfortunate things that came to light eventually got trampled and stamped out. Whereas if we have something that is, I'm not, with a great analogy, a, a certain type of algorithm that takes a, a, a particular direction, one, I think you won't be able to keep up with it because this rate of speed, these two parallel systems are so, one so fast and one so slow. So I think, and actually when I look at the, you know, the overall, and so there's two things I think around this. One is I'm really concerned about the macro picture, both in terms of opportunities you know, creating and uh, I see a reducing number of opportunities. Um, and you know, so, my question really is how can we, what's your view in terms of the people, are, how can we develop our people skills to cope with this <coughs> and create a macro picture that we can plan for? Great, thanks, Tom. Uh, second question? There. Yeah. Yes. So, my question is about uh, the revolution that uh, everybody was uh, half hinting that they'd like to see happen. I'm David Wood, I chair London Futurist as a professional. I study disruption and you might even call it revolution in business. Isn't it the case that most revolutions happen with outsiders rather than with insiders? Because insiders, namely existing schools, are constrained very recently by existing <coughs> metrics and existing commitments. And so why isn't there more focus in this discussion on some of the very interesting things that are happening outside the school system? I'm referring, for example, to École 42, School 42 in Paris, which has thrown away most of the rules about uh, university learning. It was set up by the billionaire French uh, entrepreneur Zach <coughs> in 2013. It only focuses on educating people to get a job in software and coding. There's a whole breadth of skills. That uh, some AI is involved in teaching. There's a lot of peer learning. There's a lot of peer marking as well. Uh, it's, turn, it's turned out to be very successful and in the last couple of years it's been adopted in other countries around the world, including Helsinki, including Silicon Valley, but not uh, no interest yet in the UK sadly. So are there people here from these great institutions looking at what Xavier Neil and his uh, team are doing in Paris, Amsterdam and <coughs> elsewhere? Because I think they should be. And do you think it, uh, it's part, uh, part of the answer to Song's question? I think it absolutely is because uh, it seems to be able to educate people from all ranges, even with the very little uh, previous educational background. They're t training them and getting jobs in the highest tech companies. Uh, the one in Amsterdam was set up by TomTom, Tom, uh, which is a flourishing uh, software data company. They were frustrated they weren't able to find enough highly trained uh, software engineers and data scientists without spending huge amounts of money coming from elsewhere, and now they're getting people from deprived areas slotting into their walls and tom-tom. And so 
It's not everything, but we shouldn't expect it to do everything. We should expect, this is how revolutions and disruptions work. They give up on a lot of things, but they do other things very well. And it's happening at the level of universities, and it's succeeding to the extent that employers are attaching to that. And then the next stage will be for schools to change in the same way. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about the role of career counselors because as, as it was said, um, like change doesn't come from the system, it comes from people. Um, so the role of career counselors in you know, finding job opportunities, volunteering opportunities, uh, creating this change and um, it's someone that, that the students themselves can go and talk to. Um, despite this, I feel like a lot of schools are actually scraping uh, the program and getting rid of career counselors, and it's really underfunded. So I wanted to know your opinion of like the role of career counselors in this topic. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, three uh, different questions there: sort of people, école, uh, um, um, uh, I think it was <laughs> uh, that sort of approach, um, and the whole career counselor mm -hmm. issue. Great, uh, Kelly. Um, can I start with the last one on, on careers guidance? I think that is <coughs> absolutely crucial. Um, and one thing that we found when, as the Royal Society, when we've been looking across students' access to different types of curricula and how broad their access is, um, is that in particular, their access to careers guidance is really patchy across the country. And I think that in order for all students to have these opportunities, um, we need to unify that across across the country. I think it's really, really important. Um, there are some businesses in certain areas who are doing really great things, linking up with schools, providing work experience, um, providing extra opportunities. And the fact that that is happening in some particular areas of the country, but other students just don't have access to it, is a real shame. And it really highlights the kind of inequalities in the system, I think. So being able to unify that across the country, I think would be a really, really important part of making sure that all students have the skills and knowledge necessary to be <coughs> in the future. Thank you. David? Yeah, I agree exactly with what Kenny uh, said, I think. You know, the but three, feel free to answer any of the other I questions. I will, well, in which case I will. I, just on that, the second point about um, sort of revol revolutionising the system, I think. Yeah, it's, um, it, I agree we need outsiders to come in and show uh, new approaches to how we, we deliver learning in this context. And, you know, actually, to be fair to the government, I think the you know the EdTech strategy starts to introduce these sorts of concepts, and you know, long may that particular road can continue. I think even within engineering, you're seeing new types of institutions now cropping up um, around the country. So N N NMITI, I might have pronounced it wrong, which stands for the New Model in Technology and Engineering, is looking at new ways using new technologies to teach you know really highly. Um, really, really bright young students from across, across the country to learn engineering in, in a new way. And that is, um, that, that's really, really interesting too. But I think, I, I agree with the sentiment, which is these examples are probably few and far between rather than you know, the normal approach. How embedded is the EdTech strategy becoming? I mean, this is a big deal. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you say that. Uh, so, I mean, look, let's be honest, it was launched in April. We're only July. Uh, so I think that um, we have... So it's pre-pre-pilot. So it? we, it's pretty early stage. I mean, I think that the good news <coughs> as far as this group is concerned is that um, Lord Holmes is actually our chair of our EdTech leadership group who will be taking it forwards in partnership with industry and educators to look at how they can basically deliver what we set out to deliver in the strategy. So I well, think... Who is the chair of the EdTech strategy? Uh, Lord Holmes. Oh, look, oh right, Lord Holmes. Yeah. Great. Oh yeah, we know you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is great. Great blockchain and AI man. Yeah. 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 So, so I think he's he's all over it. Um, I think that for us it is hugely important um, that we actually do look at what industry is doing, some of the really creative things that particularly our edtech entrepreneurs are doing at the moment, as I think some of them are pretty amazing. Saying that quite a lot of them are also unevaluated. And I think that it is important to recognize that for EdTech particularly, the sales pitch uh, can often be more compelling uh, than the reality. And I think that what we're trying to do with the EdTech strategy is help redress that balance. Um, sorry, do you want to? Yeah, I just want to comment on this because I, I think if you go to many industry conferences, you see amazing EdTech. Yeah. 
and it's very appealing and I think we need to be very open-minded because what we have now kind of the low-tech is not very appealing mm -hmm. and it is really like when we talked about before exam boot camps and, uh, and, and this is what has become UK has the most exam in entire Europe <coughs> primary school to sit in 70 exams these are the formal exams and on top of that they have all the mock exams which will be many many times that so they spend like 25 to 50 percent of the year sitting exams or preparing exams <coughs> uh, but with all the ed tech all this can be kind of happening automatically because technology evaluates you while actually you are on, on the job uh, so i think we should be really open-minded as a school and really try to test lots of these technologies into different kind of curriculums in different schools so i'm glad that you brought up some of those examples actually some of those examples are things that we've actually got in the attack strategy is things that we're looking at how to try and bridge the gap from where we are now to where we might be and that's <coughs> looking at how we might improve the quality of some of the uh, qualitative marketing systems that are out there so that they are at a point where we have sufficient confidence that they could be used more rigorously. Um, obviously quantitative marketing is relatively easy to do well with, but if you don't have that qualitative marketing system, you know, which we don't, uh, we're actually quite a long way away from that. I think that what I would say though on EdTech is, and I really can't stress this enough, you know, we have some amazing world-class ed tech schools in this country but we also still have schools that don't have adequate broadband and we have teachers that are in some cases really not au fait with modern technology and that's kind of fair enough but it's not acceptable in the context that we're talking in right now and um, just to respond to some of the points that have been made uh, as questions raised I think on um, uh, the school uh, the schools kind of internationally point we haven't looked at that one specifically, but we have looked at, for example, rocket schools in the US, which is actually doing something that's not that dissimilar. I'd be a little bit worried, if I'm honest, about the school that you just described, because you're training a group of people in one specific profession, which actually goes against everything that we've just been talking about, because it's possible that one day that profession won't exist in the same form, and at that point you've just trained somebody very narrowly, and that actually creates a lot of risk for that individual. Whereas I think that what we've been saying so far is that what we need is more transferability, more adaptability, and the ability to move and change. Uh, which actually I think speaks to Tom's point about possibly the ability to remain the same and I think that it is a uniquely human characteristic to be able to adapt and change uh, in a way that perhaps a machine which is fundamentally coded to do a specific thing cannot uh, and maybe we should be celebrating that, that more. Um, I think in terms of creating that kind of macroeconomic plan that you can plan for, we would say that that is the government's modern industrial strategy which sets out the priority areas that uh, we think are important. I think that it is worth bearing in mind that very, very long macroeconomic planning is really difficult. So our uh, economists in the department are very fond of citing uh, various reports made in the early 1970s by mining organisations who were arguing very vehemently at the time for the need to recruit more miners. Right, uh, careers advice just... Oh, careers advice, sorry, yes, so we are doing, uh, I think we completely acknowledge this is a problem, that's what the government's <laughs> career strategy was all about trying to address, uh, and I think the critical things that answer your question are, one, we've asked all schools to look at how they embed the Gatsby benchmarks, there are a series of um, specific things which include actually engaging with outside employer groups to look at how we can create a level playing field for careers advice. We're in the process of rolling it out. <coughs> I think I completely agree with Kelly's point. You know, we're still at the implementation stage, so things are still looking a bit patchy. But I think that you know there's a plan in place for us to address that, and what we really need is employers to support that, and I think crucially audiences like this to push it on, keep it funded and yeah, keep it yeah. going, rather than throwing it all up in the air and starting all over again. Thank you, Kira. Um, by the way, David, um, I, there's no real time to come back to you, but if you'd like to engage Kira in conversation afterwards, that would be, uh, that would be terrific. Thanks. Yeah, so on careers, um, there are some initiatives um, that, um, that I'm really fond of. Uh, stuff that's being done by funds for schools and careers <coughs> and um, and kids can directly uh, download WorkFinder, which is an app 
that um, offers them a work experience um, as well. And it's an app that offers an opportunity for startups and scale-ups to set up and offer those experiences. So those are the, um, the latest initiatives that I'm aware of that really do work. But otherwise, I agree, the career advice, um, it's very patchy. It depends, it varies from school to school. Uh, some schools are incredible at connecting kids with industry leaders, others are less so. And funding is definitely um, affecting um, uh, that, that area of, um, of school functioning. On School 42, um, I, I love it. Uh, I actually um, love it because of the interesting uh, alternative approach uh, because uh, it's student-led, uh, there, there are no teachers, so, so key, uh, not kids, but they're, they're actually for younger people age, ages 18 plus. We have looked into it. Um, I am as external as I can be in here, which is why I can say the Department of Education that they are failing um, uh, the system. Uh, but with School uh, um, it's, it's an interesting approach, which is again quite limited, as some, um, some of the uh, colleagues here have said. It's uh, really a coding only, which is quite limiting. So when we um, deliver our boot camps and hackathons and accelerator programs as well, we focus on a much broader range of skills, such as design thinking. We teach ethics, because teaching ethics, as I think, is a must when you teach computer science. Um, and so we teach a much broader um, sort of area of skills uh, compared to Kehoe uh, 42. But then there is another interesting school that I found, which is of course in Silicon Valley, uh, which was set up by Oracle, and I know Oracle is here today, which is called DTAG, which I really love. Um, and I think those kind of schools should be, should be probably um, developed in other countries as well. And I know IBM also has got a very interesting design uh, technology school and entrepreneur, with entrepreneurship elements as well. So some of the uh, corporates are designing the schools because again, they're dissatisfied with how schools are, are right, right now. And, and I think that's a step forward in my, in my view, although some of them have been criticized over you're preparing them to fit in your own industry. But I think why not? Because if they can do the job better than um, the schools, frankly, um, then all the way, um, all the better. On um, how can we develop uh, people's skills? Um, again, this is um, about connecting uh, the, the, the schools with the real industry in uh, environments such as hackathons or such as um, work experience or internship because um, it's about them interacting with the real industry, with, uh, with people in the, in the industry. Um, and, 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 and that's, I think, the best way to develop those kind of skills. And intelligence is indeed about fixing problems and uh, something that we emphasize very strongly during all of our pro um, all of our projects and programs we run. That's great. Thanks, Alina. And finally, Wayne. Um, well, it, the, my fellow panelists have answered all the questions really well, I think. Um, so I, I just want to pick up on, on two, two things. Firstly, um, it worries me greatly, and maybe I'm just a naive um, optimist, whatever, um, but it worries me greatly when we conflate education and training. Training is fundamentally important. Preparing people for a life of work is fundamentally important. But for my money, so is education. Preparing people for what has been called a good life, whatever that means. How we interact with people. How we can develop ourselves as humans. All those much, much wider things. So it worries me greatly when everything is narrowed down to mm -hmm. we're doing this work to get a job. And I've had this conversation with my own son, and that was his attitude. The reason he did his degree was because so he could get the job. I understand it. I'm not criticising that. But I think we as a society should be taking a much broader picture here. So I think that, that, that's the first thing I want to, that want to make. The second point um, is with regards to the, the notion of disruption. <coughs> And that was exactly my, my earlier, uh, my attempt earlier was to make exactly that point. My concern is we have an AI industry stuffed full of extraordinary AI techniques, stuffed full of incredible AI expertise. And what are they doing? They're just replicating and embedding the current system. That is really boring, really a waste of all that talent and energy. And what we need and I'm not suggesting they do it on their own. They need to do it in collaboration with, in position with, negotiation with educators, learning scientists, you know, the people in this room. It needs to be thought through much more to think about, well, look, we've got these amazing technologies that we haven't had before. They're here now. 
How can we use those so that we have a better education system that really supports learning for everybody and you know for the for the future years? And I think if we don't do that, it's we're wasting a huge opportunity. Thank you very much, Wayne. Now I've got one, two, and uh, I'll take. Uh, at the very far back there. So I've got three questions. Yep, you, yep. Um, and then I'm going to ask for brief uh, contributions from the panel, sort of two sentences for each member of the panel. <coughs> so I think the biggest problem is we see education as a commodity that is to be bought or sold rather than something that not only benefits us as individuals but also as a society. And I think that means that we should be investing into education for the benefit of society rather than education as a business. If we look at higher education, it is very inaccessible. You know, I'm a university student, universities um, fees are getting more like more and more expensive. And if we think about retraining the workforce, how are you gonna retrain when all of this education, all of this retraining is comes at a cost, a very expensive cost. And also we look at things like public libraries. If the, all of these are being shut down, and these are places where adult education takes place, where retraining, where you know people go to learn computer skills. If they're not there anymore, how are people who uh, you know from working class backgrounds who might not have you know access to private education or fancy computers and all of this? How are they going to get the skills that they need? Thank you very much, and gentlemen in the middle. Um, well, I'd like to come to the defence slightly of the humble teacher if I can, and I've also got a question. So I teach children aged 4 to 13. Um, I'm lucky enough to work in an independent prep school, which means I can be flexible <coughs> with my curriculum, which certainly helps me. Um, bear in mind, we do have to, have to do all these other roles, like you know, mental health counsellor and risk ana analysis, and analysis and all the rest of it. But I certainly agree that things like problem solving skills, the soft skills, collaboration, um, uh, thinking skills, listening skills are all massively important. Whether you teach them, I think we try to provide opportunities for them to be used, not specifically teaching them as such, teamwork, collaboration. You think um, they're there and you can nurture them? So absolutely, yes. Children love working together. Um, they like doing things like peer reviews, etc., working in teams, competing with teams, etc. In terms of AI specifically, I, I've taught um, an AI module to our top form, so that's age about 12. Um, but I had to go and find <coughs> and develop that material. So I think there's a question to be asked there. It isn't really coming to us. Um, and there are brilliant resources. I used uh, resources from IBM, and we did discuss things like ethics, etc. Um, some of those underlying questions as well as, well as the, the sort of history and the, the machine learning <coughs> aspects and the practical as aspects. Um, I think there can be more investment. Where it's going to come from, I don't know, because I, I agree that education is not an exciting thing compared with commerce and, and finance, etc. Um, and I'm going to be teaching AI to the uh, four next year, which is ages about eight. But I've, I've had to go and look for that information. I've had to be self-taught. I'd love to see some sort of, and I don't know how it would work, national curriculum that would be available to the state system and the private education sector that was moderated, quality marked, ideally having some sort of certification for children as well that they could gain, aim for, and actually then take forward on their CV that they create. Um, so right. it's, you know, how do we make that happen in not this disparate scattergun approach, but in a coordinated sort of way? Great stuff, thank you. And at the very far back, if you just want to stand up. Yes, yeah. uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Shama Ams. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge. So I come from it from the vantage point of a student, an international student, but also a teacher because I teach a, a, a seminar course in the politics department. Um, so my question is about where the locus of change should be with some of these reforms. A lot of panelists, um, you know, from Kelly to Wayne to others, have talked about the nature of, um, you know, uh, the academic versus the industry basis of trying to have skills acquisition. And I wonder whether there's scope in the existing system to have further collaborations between um, both of these different camps. And especially when it comes to the idea of further education, uh, what practical steps can be taken taken for students that are or people who are in work um, that to acquire these skills, uh, whether by their employers or other facilities that might exist for people to acquire the skills that they need? 
three great issues. Um, I'm afraid we've only got about six minutes left, so uh, dividing it up, it's probably um, about a minute and a half by the look of it. So uh, uh, would you like to go first, Wayne, on those? I think we've got access, we've got teaching AI, the ethics and implications of it, and then the collaborative points uh, um, made at the back. The, the, the simple answer is I agree with the points that have been made by our colleagues in the audience here. Um, I think all of these issues are really important. I think, in order to be brief, my, my closing thing was simply to say, um, I don't know about you, but I personally do not want Facebook um, running our education system. But, you know, that is what's on the table. And they have spent huge sums of money putting together systems that are being rolled out across hundreds, if not thousands, of the schools in the US. This is the kind of potential <coughs> that we as educators need to engage with to ensure that this doesn't happen. Elena. So um, I will respond to the, to the teacher from the prep school. Um, so just to address your concerns, because obviously we have been teaching AI for, for over two years now, uh, with ethics and human-centered AI and all of that. What I find works with uh, teenagers, and maybe this will be a different approach to what you, you practice, is once uh, they are inspired, by some amazing speakers, like we have speakers from Benevolent AI, DeepMind, and various other incredible companies, then what happens is interesting, is they actually go home and they figure things out by themselves. So every single advanced coder that's in this room, as a teenagers or in our network, if you ask them, where did you learn this? They will never say it's from a teacher. They'll say, I just ask Google. And they, we have teenagers aged 15, 16, who have already taken uh, the well-known Android Angus course, Machine Learning. Uh, it's a master's course. Um, so I really like the idea of a minimum, minimum invasion. I think it's called minimally invasive <laughs> approach, where teachers are less asked to teach, but it's, it's very much student-led and project-based, <coughs> and they figure it out like in School 42. Um, the rule is ask Google first, then ask your friend, then ask your mentor, and then come and talk to me. In four years of running all of these programs in so many countries, very, I don't, I can't even think of one case when a student came to ask me a question because they really do figure it out asking Google. So, but in general, on uh, closing, I would just like to say that I very much hope that um, the educational system will be rethought in a way where it's really uh, geared for uh, preparing our young people to change the world. So the right question to ask um, if you are a parent or a teacher is not what are you going to be when you when you when you when um, you finish school is. How are you going to change the world? And that, I believe, should be what school should be preparing them for. Great stuff. Thanks very much indeed, Leila. Kira, and you may need to answer the access point, I think, in yeah. particular. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, of course, I think, you know, as the Department for Education, we're worried about funding. I think it's a given. <laughs> I think our ministers have been very vocal about it, but I think that it will be for the incoming administration to decide on funding priorities and that includes on things like higher education. I think on your specific point actually about access to computers and the basic skills, uh, one thing we haven't talked about but which is absolutely essential is um, we're going to be launching a basic digital skills entitlement in 2020 which gives somebody, an adult, the same right to get training to improve their basic digital skills as they have now for maths and for English. But that's a massive step in the right direction and we are internationally leading in that sense and we're putting the funding in place to do that so i think we should celebrate that as a positive access step very quickly on the other points um, i couldn't agree with you more actually what we're talking about here is not a knowledge point it's a pedagogical point and it's about how you deliver the knowledge uh, in a way that supports some of those skills that you might want to impart and I think that what we're working on through things like the Curriculum Fund is actually looking at how we can better support teachers within the state system to recognise that they are doing those things, but they might not necessarily be communicating that they are doing those things to their classes. So if you look at you know, Twitter, EdTech, you'll see loads of examples of teachers who've actually given their classes Raspberry Pis or micro bits and said, go off and do a project. The, it actually, the, the National Curriculum does give the authority to do that, but it's having that confidence as a teacher of knowing where to look and what support to get, and I think that the National Centre for Computing Education is all about how we support teachers to do that. Um, and I think on the last point about where the legs of change should be, excellent question, really good. Um, I think that I would probably point you towards looking at something like the um, 
new institutes of technology. So we've just launched 12, and they're all about the partnership between industry, FE, and looking at how we raise aspiration and expectation in those spaces for people studying level four or five, uh, and how we can create that collaboration space to work more effectively for those groups of people. Thank you very much, Kira. David. Um, yeah, just a few points to pick up on. One, uh, I mean, the comment in general was actually how you know, young people, through the course of learning, you know, enjoy that collaboration and problem solving together. I think, I think we, we, we recognise that need very much in primary, secondary. I think when we get further up the chain, as it were, particularly in FE, I think we lose sight of that a little bit. And, you know, my, my concern is some, some of the apprenticeships that we're developing are overly job specific. And I understand why, because employers want people to be trained up in an apprenticeship that's going to suit their needs when they, you know, actually they've already hired them. Uh, but I think we need to think a bit broad about the skill sets that we're teaching apprentices. Um, just in terms of access and actually linking to the point about, you know, the locus for change, I think clearly this isn't a collective endeavour, it needs to be. And there are examples, and I, you know, I would point you back, you know, to the industrial training boards. We've been around since 1964 in one shape or form. It is a, you know, a social partnership, if you like, bringing training providers, employers, educators, and unions together to create a collective investment fund to provide the sorts of upskilling and retraining of people in the workforce. But unfortunately, we don't have those across every sector of the economy. Um, the, the challenge is how do you replicate that kind of collective model um, across the board, and I don't know what the answer is to that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so on the last point about the scope for collaboration, um, I think you're absolutely right. And education is sometimes quite pitched as quite combative with either businesses or other areas of education. And I don't think it, it should be, and it needs to be. Um, I think the Royal Society, we have a, a potential role as a convener. We have lots of contacts throughout lots of different industry and academia. Um, and we do try and do some work <coughs> between schools, businesses, and HE. And I think we should do more than that. So I'm very keen that we are involved in, in convening these, these players a bit more often. Um, and then just finally on the point about teaching resources, um, the Royal Society has some resources specifically about AI and machine learning, um, some lesson plans and also some CPD available. So if you'd like to swap contact details, then I'd love to send you more information about that. Kelly, thank you very much. And I must say, that, you know, we've covered quite a range of uh, issues here and the panel have uh, really engaged in, uh, in the discussion, which is fantastic. Um, we've still got a few questions on the table. I, I think life is ever thus. There are still, we haven't solved all the problems of the education world quite yet. We're getting there, but you know, um, it's been a fantastic uh, uh, evening. Thank you very much. And would you like to show your appreciation to our panel? Thank you very much. Two things. First of all, I want to thank you, the Jacob Thompson from Lemon Academy, who's a work experience here for Big Invasion and joining us uh, tonight. So thank you for this and uh, joining the Big Invasion of the Week. But I also want to thank you, Niki, uh, because Niki has been with, with the Big Innovation Centre for two and a half years now, and uh, she came here to, uh, as we were kicking off the old party parliamentary group on artificial intelligence, and she has created the most amazing. Uh, uh, interactive, thought leading, uh, a creative report, and managed to get all our different viewpoints somehow organized into a, a, a coherent report which we all uh, can read and we can all learn from. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we really uh, want to uh, 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 thank you, Nikki, now, and I'm sure this is not <coughs> the last time we'll see you. So thank you for this. And we give her a hand to you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, folks. I think the next meeting is October the 16th, something like that. Am I right? October 14th. October 14th. 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 Don't come two days late. 14th. Great. See you then. And have a good summer in the meantime. Thank you very much.